Who pays the bills? Who provides the profits? We all pay them in taxation, but the soldier pays the biggest part of the bill. Boys with a normal viewpoint were taken out of the fields and offices and factories and classrooms and put into the ranks. There they were remolded. They were made over. They were made to about face, to regard murder as the order of the day. They were put shoulder to shoulder, and through mass psychology, they were entirely changed. We used them for a couple of years and trained them to think nothing at all of killing or of being killed. Then, suddenly, we discharged them and told them to make another about face. This time, they had to do their own readjustment without mass psychology, without officers' aid and advice, and without nationwide propaganda. We didn't need them anymore, so we scattered them about without any speeches or parades. Many, too many, of these fine young boys were eventually destroyed, mentally, because they could not make that final about face alone. This video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. Smedley Darlington Butler was born in 1881 to an upper class Quaker family in Philadelphia, which had been in America since well before it became America. Both his father and grandfather were influential congressmen. In 1898, he dropped out of his fancy pants prep school and lied about his age to earn a commission as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps when he was only 16, earning him the nickname The Fighting Quaker. I, I don't know why I did that. But why was this 16-year-old butter bar so eager to join up in the first place? Because that same year, the United States went to war with Spain. We creatively called it the Spanish-American War, and this is, in my opinion, the most important B-list war in American history. First, you have your A-listers, like the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and World War II. These are the ones that every kid learns about in school, the ones they keep making movies about, almost always in a positive light. You know so much about these wars that you feel qualified to armchair quarterback what the generals should have done. Then you have your B-listers. These are the ones that most Americans at least know the name of and have a vague idea of when they happened, but the details are fuzzy, and the reasons why are even more so. The War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, Korea. The justification for these wars are complicated. There is no singular event we can point to like Pearl Harbor or Fort Sumter. The Alamo was not part of the Mexican-American War. See what I mean? B-list. The military historians in the audience probably already knew that and are furiously typing out a comment telling me that the U.S. declared war on Spain because the USS Maine exploded in Havana Harbor, Cuba. And that was the reason given to the public, remember the Maine to hell with Spain. But in 1974, the Navy came to the conclusion that the explosion was most likely caused by excessive tropical heat, which ignited the powder magazines or coal stores. But at the time, we were all too eager to blame the Spanish. But it's worth asking, why was the Maine hanging around Havana Harbor in the first place? Because America has always had a weird infatuation with Cuba. In 1823, the U.S. adopted what would later become known as the Monroe Doctrine, telling European powers that they could no longer establish or take over any colonies in the Americas. The New World was our sphere of influence. Thomas Jefferson was still alive at the time and wrote a letter to President Monroe saying, Do we wish to acquire to our own confederacy any one or more of the Spanish provinces, I candidly confess that I have ever looked on Cuba as the most interesting addition which could ever be made to our system of states. The control which this island would give us over the Gulf of Mexico and the countries and isthmus bordering on it, as well as all those whose waters flow into it, would fill up the measure of our political well-being. In 1890, the U.S. Census Bureau declared that the frontier no longer existed. The Wild West had been tamed and there was no destiny left to manifest. If America wanted to keep expanding, it would have to look outside of the continent. That same year, Alfred Thayer Mahan wrote The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. The book advocated for the U.S. to start taking over island territories to expand its economic and political influence, and many politicians took its message to heart. To be fair, this was at the same time as the scramble for Africa, so it's not like America came up with this idea in a vacuum. So when Cuba started fighting for independence from Spain, the US decided to keep an eye on things by parking one of our newest, biggest battleships right off the coast. We probably didn't want it to sink, but we still got the headlines we wanted. It wasn't an attack or a false flag. It was an accident that we blamed on Spain 
But thanks to sensationalist yellow journalism, America was unusually excited to enter this splendid little war. Thousands of Americans answered the call, and even politicians like Teddy Roosevelt gave up their positions to join up. I wanted to avoid this, you know. But your idea of peace left me no choice. Smedley Butler was one of those people who bought into the idea of military adventurism so much so that he dropped out of school to join as soon as possible. Unfortunately, by the time he finished training and arrived in Cuba, the fighting was over. The war ended just four months after it started and culminated in the last major land grab by the United States, coming out of it with several new island territories, creating the American Empire. Dun dun dun. There was Cuba, which we slowly withdrew from with the exception of a naval base at Guantanamo Bay. The U.S. propped up several pro-American governments there until Castro took over in 1959. Then there was Puerto Rico and Guam, which are still territories to this day, mostly because U.S. congressmen didn't like the idea of sharing the same room with non-white politicians. How can we endure our shame when a Chinese senator from Hawaii, with his pigtail hanging down his back, with his pagan joss in his hand, shall rise from his carule chair and in pigeon English proceed to chop logic. Mr. Speaker, should you preside here 20 years hence, it may be that you will have a polyglot house, and it will be your painful duty to recognize the gentleman from Cuba, the gentleman from Santo Domingo, the gentleman from Hong Kong, the gentleman from Fiji, or with fear and trembling, the gentleman from the Cannibal Islands, who will gaze upon you with watering mouth and gleaming teeth. Hawaii was annexed during this war, despite its racial makeup, partly to keep Hawaiian sugar competitive against the newly acquired Caribbean market, and partly as a refueling station for the invasion and occupation of the Philippines, which, next to Cuba, was the real prize of the war, opening up American trade with the rest of Asia. Rudyard Kipling's poem The White Man's Burden came out a year later, and again, Americans took its message to heart. The U.S. wanted to expand, but they didn't want to incorporate. Filipinos expected independence at the end of the war, similar to Cuba. When they realized that America had no intention of letting go of the islands, they understandably revolted, starting the Philippine Insurrection, or more boringly, the Philippine-American War. This is what I would classify as a D-list war, because most Americans today have no idea that we ever tried to take over the Philippines. This also happened to be Smedley Butler's second tour of duty as a newly promoted first lieutenant. Smedley's part in this war was fairly small, so he ended up getting a full torso Eagle Globe anchor tattoo and spent most of his time drinking. This will become important later, so remember that. After losing a few hundred troops to ambushes, the U.S. military cracked down on the islands in one of the most brutal campaigns in American history. This was America's first real taste of guerrilla warfare. So the U.S. put many Filipinos into concentration camps, known as reconcentrados, which were kind of the reverse of our typical understanding of a concentration concentration camp. People inside the camp were safe, though kept in extremely poor conditions, while everything outside of it was a free fire zone. Last night one of our boys was found shot and his stomach cut open. Immediately orders were received from General Whedon to burn the town and kill every native in sight, which was done to a finish. About a thousand men, women, and children were reportedly killed. I am probably growing hard-hearted, for I am in my glory when I can sight my gun on some dark skin and pull the trigger. The American public was shocked when they finally read about the reality of the war in the newspapers. American soldiers weren't supposed to act like that. Public opinion on the war turned, and Congress agreed to phase in self-governance by 1934, with eventual independence by 1944, though the Japanese and World War II would put that on hold for a few years. That was just the first of many D-list wars Smedley Butler would be involved with. In 1900, he was sent to Tietzin, China to help put down the Boxer Rebellion. Martial arts were known as Chinese boxing back in the day, so we called the mostly unarmed rebels boxers. This was a Chinese nationalist revolt against foreign economic and religious influence that lasted just over two years and was put down by an eight-nation alliance. So now American businesses could operate in China without issue. This will be a recurring theme. In 1901, Teddy Roosevelt became president and during his first term, added the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Since Europe could not interfere with the politics of the Americas, if anyone was going to interfere, it would be the United States. Thanks for keeping the peace on the continent. Bully for you! 
Here's a fun fact that I've been hammering away at for a while. The United States is not supposed to have a standing army, but we are supposed to have a navy. The Constitution says that Congress shall have power to raise and support armies for no longer than two years at a time. But in the next clause, they have the power to provide and maintain a navy. Raise and support, provide and maintain. A subtle difference, but an important one. So any time America needed something done in between all of those A-list and B-list wars, who did they call? The Marines, when it absolutely positively has to be destroyed overnight. In 1903, Captain Smedley Butler was sent to Honduras to secure the American consulate during an uprising. He had some sort of tropical fever at the time, earning him the nickname Old Gimlet Eye. The Marines would be sent to Honduras seven times during this period, though Butler himself would never return. Everything in that sand Manila video happens after Butler's time. This was the beginning of the Banana Wars. Much like cotton in the South and sugar in the Caribbean, this one crop dictated the politics of Central America for almost a century. When the industry first started, most Americans had never even heard of a banana. So all of the major marketing back in the day, while extremely catchy, was also educational, since nobody knew how to eat bananas or what to use them for. I'm Chiquita Banana and I've come to say bananas have to ripen in a certain way. You can put them in a pie, add them to your cereal, and doctors even recommend feeding them to your baby. But bananas like the climate of the very, very tropical equator. So you should never put bananas in the refrigerator. Huh. Today I learned. Americans quickly got addicted to this stuff and it became a major industry dominated by just three companies who only tolerated each other because Teddy Roosevelt was on the warpath against monopolies. Anytime these companies didn't like the outcome of an election or the government threatened to give away their unused land or nationalize a railroad, who did they call? The ghost the Marines. The major fruit companies would call on the American military multiple times over this period, keeping local governments under their thumb. These would eventually become known as banana republics. It's important to note that while this entire period is known as the Banana Wars, not all of these interventions, invasions, and occupations were directly because of bananas. After Honduras, Major Butler was sent to Panama. Why? The French had begun working on a canal through Panama during the 1880s, but eventually ran out of money and abandoned the project. At the time, the US was involved with building a canal across Nicaragua, but in 1902, a bunch of businessmen realized that it would be cheaper to take over the incomplete Panama project and try to convince Congress that Nicaragua was too dangerous for a canal by, and I couldn't make this up if I tried, mailing every senator a letter with a fake Nicaraguan stamp depicting an active volcano, which in reality was over 100 miles away from the proposed route. It worked, and Congress switched to Panama instead. But there was another problem. Panama was a province of Colombia, and Colombia would not approve of the United States purchase of the proposed canal zone. So the US supported a successful independence movement and began work on the canal in 1904. Smedley Butler was in Panama throughout construction, with the canal zone serving as a military outpost for Marines to operate out of during the Banana Wars. When Nicaragua attempted to build their canal without US support, they sent Smedley Butler. When they needed someone to supervise a rigged election or when a civil war threatened American business assets, they sent Smedley Butler. I spent 33 years and four months in active service, and during that period, I spent most of my time as a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street, and for the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer for capitalism. I suspected I was just part of a racket at the time, now I'm sure of it. I helped make Honduras right for American fruit companies in 1903. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers from 1909 to 1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar interests in 1916. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. During those years, I had, as the boys in the back room would say, a swell racket. Looking back on it, I feel I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was operate his racket in three city districts. We Marines operated on three continents. During the opening shots of World War I, the Germans tried to send an arms shipment to Mexico in the hopes of sparking another Mexican-American war to keep the US out of Europe. This was confirmed by the Zimmerman telegram a few years later. When President Wilson caught wind of the shipment, he sent Old Gimlet Eye and 5,800 Marines to intercept it and secure the city of Veracruz. Smedley earned the Medal of Honor for his actions. This was a fairly new award at the time, and they gave it out like candy. 56 total people earned it during the battle, 
the most for any singular action ever. Smedley tried to return it because he didn't think he did anything to deserve it. In 1915, a civil war began after Haitians killed their dictator president and began attacking American business assets. But never fear, the fighting Quaker is here. Outnumbered almost three to one, Major Butler and 72 Marines secured Fort Riviere from the rebels, earning him a second Medal of Honor. Smedley Butler is one of only 19 people to have earned the Medal of Honor twice. During the Civil War, soldiers and sailors were paid bonuses, in many instances, before they went into service. The government, or states, would pay as high as $1,200 for an enlistment. In the Spanish-American War, we gave prize money. When we captured any vessels, the soldiers all got their share or at least they were supposed to. Then it was found that we could reduce the cost of wars by taking all the prize money and keeping it or drafting the soldier anyway. The government learned that it could get soldiers for less money because the boys like to be decorated. Until the Civil War, there were no medals. Then the Congressional Medal of Honor was handed out and it made enlistments easier. In July 1917, the United States entered World War I after the Zimmerman telegram was made public and German submarines sank several American merchant ships. At least, that was the reason given to the public. Behind the scenes, American bankers began to worry that they wouldn't be able to collect on all the loans they gave allied nations if they lost. So the US needed to make sure that didn't happen. And that isn't my opinion, it's Smedley Butler's. He became a brigadier general upon his arrival in France, and much to his disappointment, he wasn't assigned to combat duty on the front. He was in the rear with the gear. A two-time Medal of Honor recipient and veteran of more wars than most Americans can even name, and they put him in charge of a supply depot. Cleaning up the camp earned him a third nickname, Old Duckboard. Since he served as an overqualified quartermaster during this war, Butler gained first-hand experience with the business side of war, more commonly known as war profiteering. Once the war was over, Smedley began writing articles and giving political speeches denouncing the practice, the most famous of which being War is a Racket, released in 1935. The normal profits of a business in the United States are 6, 8, 10, sometimes 12 percent. But wartime profits? That is another matter. 20, 60, 100, 300, even 1800 percent. The sky's the limit. Uncle Sam has the money, let's get it. Of course, it isn't put that crudely in wartime. It's dressed up in speeches about patriotism and love of country. But the profits jump and leap and skyrocket and are safely pocketed. Take our friends the DuPonts, the powder people. How did they do in the war? Well, the average earnings for the DuPonts for the period of 1910 to 1914 were six million a year. Now let's take a look at the average profit during the war years. $58 million a year, nearly 10 times that of normal times, and the profits of normal times were pretty good. Let's take a look at something else, a little copper perhaps. That always does well during war times. Anaconda, for instance, with average yearly earnings during the pre-war years of $10 million. During the war years, profits leaped to 34 million a year. Take the shoe people. They like war. They made huge profits on sales abroad to our allies, but they did well by Uncle Sam too. They sold him 35 million pairs of hobnailed service shoes. There were only 4 million soldiers, so eight pairs and more to a soldier. During the war, my regiment only had one pair to a soldier. Some of these shoes are probably still in existence. They were good shoes. Undershirts for soldiers cost 14 cents to make, and Uncle Sam paid 30 to 40 cents each for them. A nice little profit for the undershirt manufacturer, and the stocking manufacturer, and the uniform manufacturer, and the cap manufacturer, and the steel helmet manufacturer. All got theirs. When the war was over, Uncle Sam had some four million sets of equipment, knapsack, and all the things that go to fill them crammed into warehouses. Now they're being scrapped because the regulations have changed their contents. But the manufacturers collected their wartime profits on them and they will do it all over again the next time. Because war, war never changes. This was almost 30 years before Eisenhower's famous speech warning Americans about the military industrial complex. And if you told me this speech was about Iraq or Afghanistan, I'd believe you. After the Great War, Butler returned stateside and served in a number of administrative posts, serving as the camp commander for Quantico in San Diego. During one of his leaves in 1924, he became the director of public safety in Philadelphia, where he used his military experience to professionalize the local police department, organizing them by squad and giving them ranks like sergeant, lieutenant, and captain. His previous experience with alcoholism during the Philippine insurrection turned him on to the temperance movement. During 
Prohibition, he closed so many speakeasies that the city's upper class had him fired a year later. In 1931, he gave a political speech at a dinner party in Philadelphia, where he got in trouble for bad-mouthing Mussolini, repeating a salacious rumor that he ran over a child with his car. Since America was still trying to appear neutral, when it came time to pick a new commandant of the Marine Corps, well... We can't have a general who openly mocks foreign leaders. America was kind of okay with fascism at the time. That same year, Major General Smedley Butler retired as the most decorated Marine in US history at the time, after 33 years and four months of service. But old duckboard wasn't done serving his country. In 1932, he decided to run for a Pennsylvania Senate seat and entered the primary race as a Republican. And his political opinions were... Interesting. He ran on a dry ticket, which is for prohibition, and since this was around the time he was writing War as a Racket, he was also anti-war and anti-business. And his proposals for ending war profiteering were controversial. He thought that the decision to go to war shouldn't be left to Congress. Instead, it should be voted on by the people. The people being military-aged males and veterans. Service guarantees citizenship. This was decades before Heinlein's Starship Troopers, and at this point in history, you could be drafted before you were old enough to vote, though all that would eventually change under Nixon. Butler also suggested that during time of war, all wages be fixed at the same rate we pay the military. Soldiers in the trenches and bankers on Wall Street would be paid the same. It shouldn't come as much of a surprise that this pro-temperance, anti-war, anti-business, anti-fascist, somewhat socialist candidate lost but he continued to advocate for veterans. During World War I, veterans were not properly paid for their service. To make up for that, Congress passed the World War Adjusted Compensation Act of 1924, which gave every veteran a bonus bond to be paid out in 1945. But then the Great Depression happened. Suddenly, veterans who were out of work needed that money, and many of them couldn't wait another decade for them to mature. So what did these desperate veterans do? Do you have a structured settlement or annuity? Do you have a World War I Adjusted Service Certificate? Why wait until 1945. I'll buy it off of you today. It's your money and you need it now. Call KB Morgan 877 Cash. While many veterans sold their certificates to bankers at a fraction of their face value, 43,000 others decided to march on Washington to demand early payment. Veterans were angry. Banks caused the World War, they caused the Great Depression, and now they were, in effect, stealing their bonus bonds. The Bonus Army March of 1932 was like a beta version of the Occupy movement. In an all-too-familiar move, the media tried to portray the protesters as a lawless group of greedy tramps. And who was the... Michael Moore of this movement? Makes me so damn mad a whole lot of people speak of you as tramps. By God, they didn't speak of you as tramps in 1917 and 18. Oh. Let me tell you, let me tell you something. I've been all over the world. I've seen you fellows on the streets in Washington. There isn't this well-behaved group of citizens in the world that's sitting right in this camp. Take it from me. This is the greatest demonstration of Americanism we've ever had. Pure Americanism. Willing to take this beating as you've taken it. Stand right steady. You keep every law. And why in the hell shouldn't you? Who in the hell yeah, has done all the bleeding for this country and for this law and, and this constitution anyhow but you fellas? To break up the Bonus Army demonstration, President Hoover sent the army led by General Douglas MacArthur and Majors Patton and Eisenhower, the would-be heroes of World War II versus the underpaid heroes of World War I. The army used horses and tanks against the veterans, driving them out of their camp and burning it to the ground. When it was all said and done, two veterans had been killed and over 50 had been injured, all because they didn't want to wait 30 years to be paid for their service. Later that year, FDR won the election and began implementing his New Deal to dig the country out of the Depression, including putting veterans to work. Many of these programs were specifically designed to benefit the banking industry and prevent another crash, like the Glass-Steagall Act and the creation of the FDIC. But his 1933 decision to end the convertibility of the dollar to gold made bankers and wealthy businessmen particularly angry. So angry, in fact, that they planned a fascist coup. Bruh. But every coup needs an army, and here is a very large group of veterans angry at the government. 
Maybe if they promised to pay them their bonuses, they'd join the cause. And they needed a leader that these veterans already trust. I appeared before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government and break down our democratic institutions. In November 1934, retired General Smedley Butler appeared before the McCormick Dickstein Committee, a precursor to the House Un-American Activities Committee, and exposed what became known as the business plot. While there is no audio or video of his testimony, a written transcript, as well as the entire committee's report, is available in the links below. The national media at the time dismissed Butler's testimony as a gigantic hoax, but they were also owned by some of the people implicated in the plot. On the flip side, the final report from the McCormick Dixie Committee stated, In the last few weeks of the committee's official life, it received evidence showing that certain persons had made an attempt to establish a fascist organization in this country. There is no question that these attempts were discussed, were planned, and might have been placed in execution when and if the financial backers deemed it expedient. They went on to say that this attempt had no connection with any European fascist movement. This was entirely homegrown. But then they didn't pursue it any further. None of the people implicated in the plot were ever charged or called to testify, which would have included some pretty famous people. Names like J.P. Morgan, the DuPonts, William Randolph Hearst, Prescott Bush, father of George H.W. and grandfather to W., and Alfred P. Sloan. You might recognize Alfred P. Sloan from that recent Carlos Maza video. Long story short, and trust me, you want Carlos to give it to you long, when Sloan failed to overturn the government, he changed tactics and tried to turn the people against it. But that wouldn't happen for another decade or two. General Smedley Butler was like the Forrest Gump of American imperialism. If it happened during the first half of the century, he was there. From major wars in Cuba and France to minor invasions of China and Nicaragua, if America needed it done, they called Smedley Butler. And when it came time for America to pay back its veterans, Smedley Butler was there. General Butler continued to advocate for veterans and gave anti-war, anti-business speeches around the country until his death in 1940. The U.S. would be pulled into World War II just over a year later. The Cold War, the Red Scare, and the patriotic education that came along with it caused most of Smedley Butler's deeds and message to be forgotten to history. I am not a fool to believe that war is a thing of the past. I know the people don't want war, but there is no use in saying that we cannot be pushed into another war. When our boys were sent off to war, they were told that this was a war to make the world safe for democracy, and a war to end all wars. Well, 18 years after, and the world has less democracy than it had then. And very little, if anything, has been accomplished to assure us that the world war really was the war to end all wars. There is only one way to disarm with any semblance of practicability. That is, for all nations to get together and scrap every ship, every gun, every rifle, every tank, and every warplane. Even this, if it were possible, would not be enough. The next war, according to experts, will be fought not with battleships, not by artillery, not with rifles, and not with machine guns. It will be fought with deadly chemicals and gases. Secretly, each nation is studying and perfecting newer and ghastlier means of annihilating its foes wholesale. Yes, ships will continue to be built, for shipbuilders must make their profits, and guns will still be manufactured, and powder and rifles will still be made, for the munitions makers must make their huge profits, and the soldiers, of course, must wear uniforms, for the manufacturers must make their huge war profits too. But victory or defeat will be determined by the skill and ingenuity of our scientists. If we put them to work making poison gas and more and more fiendish mechanical and explosive instruments of destruction, they will have no time for the constructive job of building greater prosperity for all peoples. By putting them to this useful job, we can all make more money out of peace than we can out of war. So I say, to hell with war! I'm Chiquita Banana, and I've come to say bananas need to ripen in a certain way. Brilliant marketing. That'll be stuck in your head for hours. And speaking of marketing, this video is brought to you by CuriosityStream.com slash Knowing Better. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles, which you can access across multiple platforms. Check out Apocalypse, Never Ending War, and learn how America and Europe rebuilt after World War I and how they handled their veterans. Or maybe you want to learn about the Panama Canal over on Nebula. Nebula is 
a streaming service built by fellow YouTubers to free us from the imperialism of the algorithm. Learn how the locks work on the Panama Canal from Wendover Productions. Or learn about the Chinese plan to finish the route across Nicaragua from real life lore. Along with all of your favorite creators, all of my content is hosted there ad-free, and viewers who watch this video on Nebula are currently seeing an extended version of the Banana Song. Check it out by also signing up for a Curiosity Stream using the link below. They're currently running a sale where you can get both Curiosity Stream and Nebula for only $14.79 a year. You'll also be supporting the channel when you do. I put a lot of time this month into revamping the set, lighting, and color, so let me know what you think down below. If you'd like your name added to our swell little racket, head on over to patreon.com slash knowingbetter, or for a one-time service adjustment, paypal.me slash knowingbetter. Don't forget to intervene with that subscribe button or the join button if you'd really like to be part of the plot. Check out the merch at knowingbetter.tv, follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and join us on the subreddit.